Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to be here, and uh, indeed, I'm uh, uh, spending the year at Radcliffe, and I'm looking for collaborations and get, you know, I hope to get people excited about uh, computational sustainability. And uh, as uh, Greg uh, uh, mentioned, uh <coughs> But I, I would say I, I started, you know, over perhaps in the last five, seven years, I started uh, uh, shifting the focus of uh, my research toward problems uh, 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 centered uh, on c sustainability questions. Uh, Greg mentioned the NSF expedition really allowed me to immerse myself in this new research area together with uh, my collaborators, uh, faculty, and students. And indeed, the magnitude of the project, the large NSF uh, uh, expedition, really made a big difference. Uh, you probably recognize several faces here. M maybe you don't, the computer science don't recognize some several faces too. And that has to do with the nature of these problems. You know, we really have to have a very interdisciplinary uh, 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 research uh, group. Uh, interestingly, uh, <coughs> one of the, the most exciting aspects of this project, it has really been uh, an exciting adventure, is we, we are exposed to uh, new questions, new computational questions that we have not encountered before. And therefore, this is really forces us to advance the state of the art of uh, 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 computer science, and hopefully with impact in terms of uh, sustainability. So a very exciting area, and that's exactly what I want to tell you about today. But, you know, before I actually thought that I would use a few slides and I would start with the preamble. Uh, Greg and David mentioned that this is a, a, a mixed uh, audience with CS and non-CS uh, 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 people. And recently I gave a public talk at Radcliffe for a mainly non-CS talk. In fact, you know, we had you know, musicians, uh, philosophers, computer, well, two computer science, physicists, so a very broad audience, and I thought I would tell them a little bit about computer science. Of course, a lot of you know about it, but I thought uh, perhaps it would, I would give you a bit of a perspective, a very light popular science perspective, but emphasizing some key aspects. Next year uh, is going to be the, the, the celebration of the centenary of Alan Turing's birth. Uh, Alan Turing's uh, uh, work has uh, impacted the field tremendously. In particular, he proposed a, a very simple yet powerful computational model to, to really formalize the notion of computation and computability. It's you know, so powerful, we refer to this as a universal Turing machine. And in fact, this is as you know, you know the, uh, uh, a concept of a universal computing device. What's interesting about this concept, it really allows us to separate uh, 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 between hardware and software, and in fact, one can just change the functionality of a computer by uploading new software. And this is really going to, uh, it has impact dramatically uh, our field. Uh, I have to say, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Turing really uh, uh, is one of the founders of the field, and he has impact dramatically the field that, in fact, we have uh, uh, our Nobel Prize is the Turing Award, and I was delighted to tell our uh, fellows that you know the Turing Award uh, uh, winner this year is uh, from uh, um, Harvard. So during the first phase, really research focused on developing fast computers, easy to program, and good at uh, communicating. Uh, so. Uh, Alan Turing is one of, as I mentioned, the founder. Uh, von Neumann proposed the uh, von Neumann uh, architecture that is really inspired by uh, uh, Alan 
Turing's uh, model. And basically, the transistor led to the digital revolution and the second and third generation of uh, uh, computers, allowing a mass production of computers in the 60s. So uh, uh, IBM and uh, uh, DEC and Univac and other companies start commercia commercializing uh, 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 the machines. The internet really started, the, the military internet uh, started in the 60s, and obviously this is going to really be uh, a key for the information age. But perhaps it, the 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 PC really made the was the you know the the the, the how we uh, <coughs> how computer science became uh, accessible to the masses, and really it popularized and gave access uh, uh, to the general public to computing, in particular when IBM starts selling uh, the IBM PC, even though we know Apple and Atari, they, they, they started it. Another key, uh, 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 key uh, uh, invention was the public key system that will uh, impact dramatic electronic commerce. So after this first phase, n now researchers uh, you know, uh, became more more ambitious, and the goal was to actually broaden the field. And the, the goal is to broaden the field, in particular with smarter and user friendlier computers. That's when uh, new areas, uh, research areas, start having more, uh, uh, become more relevant, such as AI, artificial intelligence, vision, natural language, machine learning, uh, robotics, etc. Uh, in terms of user friendly, Computers, obviously, Steve Jobs was uh, 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 a master. Uh, Tim Lee Berners came up with the, the World Wide Web that was popularized with Mosaic. And the big uh, event for AI was when Kasparov uh, 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 or Deep Blue defeated Kasparov, uh, and uh, you know, chess was perceived as the ultimate intelligent task. Recently, another major uh, event was when uh, they, there was a competition, uh, uh, and uh, 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 six cars actually were able to finish a uh, uh, driverless uh, car race uh, of 131 miles. And recently, there was the context where uh, you know another IBM machine, Watson, defeats the Jeopardy uh, champion. So. So basically, we have seen tremendous progress. And uh, uh, what's, that's one of the messages that I wanted to point out to the Radcliffe audience, how you know, a, a simple computation, sorry, mathematical model was so powerful that actually led to all these uh, variations of computers with you know, very sophisticated sensors and actuators from uh, the ENIAC, the supercomputer, the TiVo, etc., and in particular, we can think of the iPhone as a, a, a good example of an universal machine where you have a phone, but it's a music player, a computer, a TV, etc. So this has been incredible for uh, the field, and basically now the 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 question is what's next? What, what are the directions in terms of computer science? Well, now I think the big trend is for computer science to reach out to other disciplines. And in, in particular, the, the key theme is how to infuse uh, computing and information technology into other disciplines. The opportunities are tremendous given the exponential growth in computational uh, uh, resources and uh, algorithmic developments. We may think, well, uh, maybe this will just give us more you know, uh, 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 compute power, data crunching. Well, perhaps more than that. And here I'm quoting Steve Strogart, <laughs> who actually did his PhD uh, at uh, Harvard. He writes for the New York Times, and he was commenting about this article by uh, Google researchers where he says there is the option of training complex computational models with good predictive power, but too complex for human comprehension, no explanatory capacity. 
Well, this he was referring to this paper by uh, Peter Narvik, uh, uh, Fernando Pereira, and uh, Alan Levy, where they talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of data, in particular about automatic machine translation. And here I type, I'm Portuguese, I type this in Portuguese, and voila, that's the French, but <laughs> uh, you have a, a, a very good translation uh, of this. And what's amazing is that underlying the, the Google machine translation is a very complex machine and statistical learning model that is automatically trained on millions and millions of examples that they have because of the European Union. They have tons and tons of examples, documents written in several languages. You know, there's not really a sophisticated underlying linguistic model at all. In fact, often the programmers don't even uh, are not uh, familiar with the target language themselves. So, so this is quite remarkable. And uh, the, uh, the basically, you know, going back to Steve's, uh, St Steve Strogatz's uh, quote, you know, there's. Perhaps in the future, our scientific theories are not really limited by the complexity, by our own uh, cognitive abilities. We will be able to uh, develop complex models if we have the right amount of data and enough inference power, then a machine perhaps can uh, train a highly complex model and use it as a predictive engine. So we are seeing several disciplines taking advantage of, uh, uh, of uh, the power of uh, 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 these models, in particular, for example, computational biology and computational linguistics. And I think that perhaps we can do the same for computational sustainability. So that is really the big vision for computational sustainability. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about sustainability and sustainable, sustainable development. Then I'll give some examples of problems and themes at, uh, uh, mainly at Cornell. And then I'll talk, I'll have uh, conclusions. So the notion of, there are different notions of sustainability, but perhaps, you know, a good one was introduced in 1987 by the United Nations, the World Commission on Environment and Development. This commission was led by a woman, uh, Gro Brantland, then the Prime Mi uh, Minister of <coughs> Norway. And basically, they, they had a report where, for the first time, they raised serious concerns about the state of the planet and introduced the notion of sustainability and sustainable development. Development that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromise the ability of future generators to meet their needs. So clearly, from a computational point of view, there's a key aspect that you can uh, immediately recognize here is dynamics. You know, you need to think about future. They actually emphasize that sustainability is not only about the environment or energy, as Greg was mentioned, green energy, but really we need to look at the interactions between environment, economic, and societal uh, aspects. And that really makes you know, sustainability problems are very, very hard. And I have to say, sometimes there are days that, you know, I don't even know how we can start. Or, so it can be overwhelming. Uh, you know, the report also emphasized, indeed, the need for policies for sustainable development. And the aspects that I want to point out is that key issues concerning the design of policies for sustainable development really translate into decision optimization and learning problems that have significant computational challenges. And yet, computer science have not really looked at this problem much. Problems concern 
concerning data analysis, interpretation, how to integrate different uh, 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 sources of data, how to learn the models, how to optimize the models. So these are really, uh, 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 there are really uh, 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 very uh, profound computational uh, challenge that uh, 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 we should be uh, 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 studying and therefore we need to really develop a, a critical mass in this new field of computational sustainability. Well, I'm going to actually start with one of the problems that got me into, uh, that, you know, one of the first problems, and those who know my research will recognize why I got, I mean, perhaps. So, as you know, agriculture is, uh, uh, an important source of greenhouse gas emissions. Recently, there was a, a, a report, a paper in Nature by several scientists. They looked at several uh, crucial biophysical systems, and uh, basically, they were interested in uh, looking at how far we are from the tipping point. One of the, the systems were, was nitrogen cycle, and you see we've crossed the, this past the, the tipping point dramatically. Well, fertilizers have revolutionized the way we produce food and in a positive way, but with very negative effects at the same time because they are based on nitrogen and therefore they create things like uh, uh, dead zones like this one in the Gulf of Mexico. And interestingly, typically, it's known that, for example, in the U.S., farmers use way more uh, fertilizer than they should. And on the other hand, there are, are areas in uh, Africa where people could use fertilizers to really increase productivity. Here is an example, and this, for example, for corn, corn ethanol, if you look at a uh, uh, 500 acres farm, the amount of uh, nitrous oxide, this is like the laughing gas uh, loss for a, corn of, uh, a field of this size, is the equivalent to seven times around the earth driving. So it's quite dramatic. This is just for a small field. Now imagine for the large scale. So Cornell actually has a state, uh, uh, it, uh, it's also a state school, you may not know, and it has this land, state, uh, land grant mission, and they are, you know, uh, advise farmers on how to, to uh, uh, for example, use fertilizers. And they have uh, experiments in terms of uh, 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 devising or getting the right amount of fertilizers. So, one of the issues is to design experiments to really understand the amount, the right amount of fertilizers that should be used. Uh, a structure, a mathematical structure that is used for designing experiments is uh, uh, the, ma uh, the mathematical structure of Latin squares. Uh, I'm not going to go in details why, but you probably have played with them. Uh, uh, so Duco is a particular case of a Latin square with additional structure. In a Latin square, you don't repeat a symbol in a row and in a column. That's exactly the same with the Soduco. And basically, uh, what they need for agronomic experiments, they need special Latin squares with an additional structure that basically all the treatments, think of each treatment as a color, have to be uh, have to have the same distance across the, the field. So it really doesn't matter, just think it's yet another Latin square with a more complex combinatorial structure that uh, makes the problem we'll see. I thought it would m make a big difference. As I said, I have studied this Latin square structure ad nausea before when I would just do little things without any meaning or kind of. <laughs> uh, but frankly, actually, it's such a rich structure that I've done things like, uh, for example, studying the, the, uh, the completion of these Latin squares led us to the discovery of uh, heavy tail behavior in combinatorial search. Then we introduced randomized search. So it's actually, w I should say, it was incredibly useful in terms of 
advancing you know algorithmic uh, uh, techniques for computer science and i when i gave a talk at cornell the, the harold vanas uh, 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 professor in the crop and soil crop and soil science got very excited and that's how we start working together and he asked me to generate spatially balanced latent squares and I, I, at the time i said oh sure that should be trivial because i can complete latent squares that's hard it is uh, np hard uh, or the decision version it's np complete up to order 60 so this should be trivial and not we discover not really we tried all kinds of uh, encoding sat uh, ip whatever we could not solve for orders greater than six so this was quite a shock I have to say, luckily, or I don't know <laughs> if it's luckily, but at the time I had a major accident that I couldn't walk for, I, don't, I didn't even know if I would be walking. Uh, so I had, I spent, you know, days staring at these structures and, uh, and it was quite incredible in revealing all the structures that you could get from, from these balanced Latin squares. So from here, then we thought, well, there are lots of properties in addition to the property of uh, 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 balanced Latin squares, you know. For example, by looking at uh, 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 a variety of the solutions for the six, we could see that symmetry was a, 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 a property over and over again. But there were other properties. And so, the question was, well, perhaps what we should do is we are going to try to produce balanced Latin squares with additional properties that we impose. Let's impose symmetry. Let's impose, uh, 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 you know, way more sophisticated properties that we uncover with machine learning techniques or visually. I have to say local search uh, techniques really didn't work here at all because of one of the constraints. It was very hard. So this was quite exciting, and in fact, by doing this, we developed this notion of streamlining constraints, where basically we would look at uh, uh, lots of uh, solutions for uh, low orders, for example, for order six, automatically discover interesting properties, and then impose those as constraints that we could, you know, so we would produce Latin squares that were balanced, but they would also have other properties. If you couldn't find any, we would retract that property and do a global search. So this was very interesting. And in fact, we were able to go from 6 to order 35 and look at this structure. This is a structure where you, we basically permute the columns of a cyclic Latin square, and that led to this structure. So this was quite exciting. Well, we now could uh, 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 solve uh, very large problems. But as computer science, we never, the idea that we are just solving a particular problem is a little disturbing. So, and you know, I always tell my students, let's think big and put the big question. And the big question is, can we actually find a way of streamlining search in an independent way? Can we produce these constraints in an independent way that is not tied to the particular problem? And the answer was yes. We actually were very excited because we, 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 we uh, looked at uh, the work by Valiant and Vazarini on unique set. We were familiar with using random parity constraints. This basically, they use this for, uh, 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 to show that unique set is hard. And you know, it's a, a negative result, to, but you know, the, 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 the technique really was quite uh, 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 remarkable. And we could use these randomized parity constraints to partition the search space uh, and uh, it, this independently of the particular domain. And that was you know, quite interesting because now we could solve other problems in other uh, uh, domains with this very generalized uh, technique. And in fact, now we could not only uh, find solutions, we could also count and sampling solutions. And this 
uh, for the, again, I'm going to mention this. We actually, this was a, a best paper at AAAI. And I use this example to say how, you know, often you start with a particular problem. You, you know, solve this problem, ask the questions, try to put, you know, your research question in broader terms. And that will lead, that, that leads to, uh, you know, often uh, uh, major uh, insights and you can have a general uh, technique. So now the question is, even though this problem is, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't really solve it uh, efficiently, is this a, a hard problem? Is there a construction for this problem? Well, our intuition was yes. You know, in fact, for example, orthogonal Latin squares, there was a conjecture, uh, conjecture by Euler that took 100 years to solve, but it's an easy problem. So can we push this idea to try to find the construction? That was the challenge that took us only seven years to solve, but I'm very happy to report that my student actually found a construction for uh, these uh, structures when n is uh, uh, 2 to the n plus 1 is prime, we can actually uh, find a construction. And we have a construction. And we, uh, 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 Ronan has proved that, indeed, it generates balanced Latin squares. And, uh, 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 and this, this is uh, obviously a, a, an efficient uh, algorithm. The quick question is now, can we do this for arbitrary orders? Well, this is still an open problem. So now at a bigger, at a now higher level, we are working with the, the uh, crop and soil science, where we are uh, now trying to produce models and uh, 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 very uh, uh, complex models. Actually, we have several people uh, in scientific computing uh, uh, working, uh, looking at these problems, where basically you want to adapt the amount of fertilizer uh, 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 as a function of uh, uh, the soil composition, uh, weather, etc. So these models are uh, quite complex. And the key issue is to actually be able to infer the, the, the parameters of the models, another inverse optimization problem. So I actually am spending way more time. Let me now talk about another uh, problem. Another key problem in uh, sustainability concerns uh, biodiversity. Biodiversity loss has been dramatic. And key causes of biodiversity loss have to do with habitat loss and fragmentation due to the deforestation, urbanization, et cetera. Uh, so one way uh, biologists are trying to increase landscape connectivity to, to help uh, uh, reducing breeding and increase genetic uh, diversity. So we are working, for example, with uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, trying to uh, establish wildlife corridors that link core bi biologic, uh, biological areas to allow animal movement. For example, here we have Yellowstone Glacier Park and Salmon Solway, and we would like to connect these uh, uh, reserves with this large uh, uh, corridor that's not really a, you know, a tiny little corridor. It's like a big connected component. So you know, challenge, and I will talk about that, is to actually infer habitat suitability for the different species. But you know, if we assume that is given, now we have uh, a, a problem that we uh, uh, refer to as the connected subgraph problem, where we have a graph, we have uh, uh, you know, the reserves or terminals, and we want to find the connected component that contains the reserves. It's fully connected. The cost of buying these is below the given budget. And if we have more than the mean cost, we want to maximize the utility for the bears, for example, for the grizzly bears. This is an NP-hard problem. But interestingly, you know, real world problems are full of structure that we can actually uh, 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 exploit. I, again, if, this, if we just look at the mean cost corridor, this is the Steiner tree problem, as you know. 
uh, uh, you may know, some of you, that uh, when we have a, a small number of terminals, we actually can solve this efficiently. And here we have, as we increase the granularity, the solution for uh, uh, the, the, the mean cost corridor for th this uh, problem that, interestingly, they had estimates in the order of over $100 million. And it, you can actually do this for about $7 million, which was quite surprising. But now, if you, we increase the number of reserves, the, now we start having uh, scalability issues. But for this problem, actually, we can solve it. But now imagine that we have more money than the mean cost solution. Now, this problem, we need to maximize the utility. And again, this is uh, 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 hard. But again, by you know, looking at typical case analysis, by identifying some problems and considering several encodings, including encodings, for example, the way we, we prove optimality or, or close to optimality for this problem is using an exponential encoding that's quite counterintuitive. But this exponential encoding really gives good bounds, et cetera. And I'm going to skip this, but, but it's interesting. Just I will mention that. You know, obviously now when we are considering several species now, we need to consider dynamics of interactions, how to factor in the different uh, habitat requirements. And I will use this again to illustrate another issue that there is the well-known Steiner tree problem. But now, if you really need to consider different uh, requirements for the species, now you have to consider uh, you know, different graphs. So there's no uh, uh, problem. Nobody has studied that problem. So we actually generalized, introduced this tiny multigraph problem that basically it's uh, uh, the generalization of the Steiner tree, where now you want to factor in that different species have different requirements, and therefore they, there are areas they may not share, etc. Interesting, this, po this problem is uh, uh, NP-hard. Note that the Steiner tree, as you know, if you just have two reserves that you want to connect with the shortest pass, that is an easy problem. It is the, s the shortest pass problem. Here, if you have two terminals and two species, even on planar graphs, that problem is uh, uh, NP-hard. But again, we were surprised because we are actually now uh, 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 building corridors for uh, uh, different species, including the wolverine. Do you know what a wolverine is? I actually didn't. I knew what I knew about the Wolverine was from X-Men. I have a 13-year-old, <laughs> and I thought it would be a mean wolf, but it's actually a mean weasel. <laughs> so, so, and it's highly endangered. Actually, in the Rocky Mountains, they have about 50. It's really sad. So again, another point that I want to emphasize is by doing these algorithms that, you know, were uh, we were uh, 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 we considered the problem motivated by a sustainability question, the conservation. Obviously, it they can also be applied in other contexts, such as you know sensor networks, social networks. That's the the sexy topic nowadays. So uh, there are many other uh, areas where we can uh, apply this. We have. Uh, 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 an effort uh, for for computer games for you know uh, middle school. This is Boynton School <laughs> in in Ithaca, and my son actually was a guinea pig for these uh, 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 games, and you know that's quite exciting. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, bird conservation, another endangered species. This is. The uh, RCW, red cockade woodpecker, this is uh, 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 an, uh, considered uh, uh, by the federal government as an endangered species. This is actually what it's called the keystone species because it is the primary excavator of cavities used by many other species. Uh, so we are working with this conservation fund. 
and they want to, you know, they are managing this property, the uh, palmetto pear tree preserve, and they are trying to increase the level, the population level of RCWs, the red cockade woodpeckers. How do they do this? Well, there are several um, management options, such as buying new land adjacent to where the current populations live, building artificial cavities, and translocating the birds. So again, this is you know, an optimization problem. It is also basically, you can think of it as you are trying to maximize the diffusion of these birds, the spread of a cascade. But you know what's interesting, and you know, these problems, that is a common theme. You really need to consider dynamics. You need to model the dynamics of the bird, the, the biological and e ecological aspects, how they move, how they reproduce, etc. And you need to couple this with an optimization model to tell you how you should uh, manage uh, the, the properties and where you should move the birds and build cavities, etc. They discover that building cavities really helps them because they, li you know, they live about uh, seven years and it takes them six years to build a cavity. So it's uh, a life of hard work. So, uh, so in order to do this, you know, these models really become quite challenging. And uh, uh, because you want to think long term, you need to, to really plan uh, uh, long term we have very you know, challenging computation issues scaling up the solutions. We are using things such as uh, you know, stochastic optimization and sample averaging, approximation, et cetera, which seems to outperform clearly greedy algorithms that uh, uh, make assumptions about, for example, the submodularity of the function, which is not the case here and therefore greedy, greedy uh, uh, strategies really uh, outperform here. And again, the, these kinds of problems occur in different settings. In, for example, business where you have several actions to try to maximize the spread of a phenomenon, such as viral marketing or social networks, et cetera. But also, you can also see uh, uh, almost the dual of this, where you want to minimize the spread for invasive species, uh, et cetera. Invasive species, actually, that is uh, uh, an interesting area of research and with very challenging uh, problems. Well, there are many other levels of complexity. Uh, how to get the data? How do we estimate where the species are and what they like? Their you know, habitat suitability, movements, migrations. How do we consider species interactions, climate change? Uncertainty. There are many other factors, and uh, that I'm not even, uh, uh, you know, mentioning. But uh, you know, all kinds of mechanisms and uh, ways of uh, uh, acquiring land, etc. In terms of data acquisition, uh, obviously the sensor networks are playing a key role. And in fact, for example, there is this interesting project by NASA and Cisco. They, I think it has a, a cool name, the Planetary Skin Institute, where the goal is to create this global nervous system that will cover, you know, will have land, sea, air, and space-based sensors. Uh, there are many computational challenges in terms of data, where to locate, for example, when, where to locate the sensors, when, and how to infer. Uh, 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 from uh, 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 a network, to make inference from a network of centers. There are questions in terms of, for example, uh, you need to have uh, uh, sensors that uh, are, uh, uh, harvest the energy th themselves. So very interesting questions. There's also a very special sensor that is the obviously the human sense of, of very sophisticated because it's still much easier for us to identify a species than have you know a, 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 an automatic uh, uh, program identifying species and Cornell really has uh, uh, several uh, programs the lab of ornithology has this 
uh, amazing citizen science program where basically it's called eBoard. Anybody interested in boards can be involved and submit uh, data, uh, uh, share data with other people, and have access to the data uh, uploaded by, by uh, other people. And basically, we have, in fact, over 80 million bird uh, uh, observations from more than 500,000 locations. This really uh, you know, is a way for us to get very meaningful data because, it, as I said, it's you know, more reliable than uh, 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 automatic uh, uh, identification of birds. And uh, com you know, uh, we combine with, obviously, a multitude of other sources. But also, it um, is a way of increasing uh, literacy. And uh, 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 in fact, that's how several people get uh, involved in science is, for example, with bird watching. James Watson started his career as uh, a bird watcher. And they have access to all kinds of online kits, etc. Recently, we actually produced the State of the Birds, which is a report about uh, you know, the, the, the distributions of species uh, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, there are several, this is becoming a very active research area. For example, Steve Phillips, uh, Miro Dudik, and Rob Shapiro uh, introduced the MaxEnt, uh, Max Entropy model for, for species distributions. And then variations, this, they, this model only uh, considers presence uh, uh, data. But if you uh, consider also presence and absence data, then you have a logistic regression model. Key issues is how, for example, to factor in. I mentioned that we let everybody submit data. So then we have little kids submitting data and you know scientists submitting data so how do you factor in the expertise of the different uh, 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 observers we have for example um, uh, actually another issue is the how uh, the bias the, the if you look at this is the distribution of observations in the US and you see that they are highly concentrated along what? What do you think that's the? I, exactly, cities. That's where people live. That's where you know, they submit observations there. You don't have many observations there. So that is a problem for our model. So how can we try to correct that? How can you reduce the uncertainty and increase the, the accuracy of the models? Uh, uh, so this goes to, so how can you reduce the accuracy, uh, sorry, increase the accuracy of your models and uh, reduce the uncertainty? So here uh, we are looking at uh, 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 approaches where we have a separate learning structure that is going to try, to, that tries to predict the impact on model uncertainty of adding new labels. And if you use, uh, uh, for example, a linear function regression, you basically have an AppSAC, and therefore you have a, a, a submodular uh, uh, function that will let you use a greedy uh, uh, heuristic and get a, 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 an approximation with guarantees. Well, one problem still is how can we engage citizens to go ideally to the locations that we need, so mechanism design. And now, if we combine different models, considering multiple scales, temporal and spatial scales, and that's what uh, 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 Daniel Fink uh, 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 and others uh, did, you can you know, have a, some uh, a good idea. Obviously, we can, uh, there are many opportunities for uh, um, improving these models, basically you combine uh, information from uh, a variety of sources, uh, eBirds, the observations, land cover, census, it's a bit of a la Google style, uh, meteorology, etc. And uh, then with tremendous computational power, we use whatever we can. In fact, we have the largest allocation of TerraGrid for problems concerning ecology. 
And we actually also have a, a cluster, Yahoo cluster and data one and our own cluster. We actually just got a, a, a cluster from NSF that puts us in the top 500. All this, and we could produce this report in three months that corresponds to about 10 years of computation. And basically, we are looking at, uh, you know, the, the patterns of bird species occurrence across uh, the US, patterns of migration, uh, uh, try to infer impacts of climate change. We are also in, uh, including different models of climate, which makes it very, very tricky. And so here is a visualization of part of it where you see for this board, you see that it arrives in the US in April. Now it's going moving. And around June, uh, middle of June, it starts going down. And it leaves the US end of uh, October. So, you know, obviously, this is far from being, you know, a, 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 a bulletproof uh, uh, view of how things are. In fact, for example, one thing that here we don't represent is of a certainty. And, uh, you know, this is static, but now when you are trying to factor in different climate change models, this really becomes challenging. And there are really uh, 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 deep questions in terms of uh, 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 predicting, uh, incorporating models such as uh, climate change models. So uh, we have, uh, you know, we are looking at uh, other problems. And again, we really try to uh, 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 address different areas. And in particular, for example, we are working with uh, uh, development economists and sociologists looking at uh, issues such as poverty mapping and uh, study of migrations. Interestingly, poverty mapping is not completely different than species distribution. I mean, obviously, it's way more challenging because now we are dealing with people. But you can use some of the same techniques. We are also looking at migrations of pastoral tribes. And uh, uh, again, there are, for example, for us to try to design corridors, one of the things that we are trying to do is we have actually data from uh, color data from uh, animals that we, 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 we trace and are, we are trying to infer, you know, the habitat and the corridors, the real corridors they produce. Well, we are actually, we have uh, uh, projects looking at the migrations of pastoral tribes that people really don't know much about how they migrate and how their decision process. And we are trying to infer that from the, 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 uh, you know, the, the data we have. And in fact, now we even have, in collaboration with NASA, we are also uh, deploying um, uh, 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 radio callers that uh, 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 we are uh, putting uh, <coughs> on the cattle. So again, there are s several problems that share the same structure. I don't really have time to talk about uh, uh, this would be a whole different area. For example, how to, to design uh, 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 um, policies for natural resource management for fisheries. That is basically you have a dynamical system, and now you want to define optimal policies when to fish, when to open a fishery and close the fishery, so that you you know guarantee that the the, the fish stock has time to replenish. So th these uh, uh, kinds of problems are very challenging. They lead to interesting uh, MDPs, POMDPs, uh, and more complex problems. We also have some projects in terms of the electric uh, car and the smart grid. And, and uh, another uh, project that we, we have concerns the discovery, you know, or uh, uh, the analysis of X-ray diffraction data for material discovery for fuel cell technology. And I think I have some, a few minutes. Let me, I thought I would 
talk a little bit about this problem. I assume you've heard uh, more about the smart grid, etc. So uh, let me give you, uh, and this is really, you know, again, a, a more uh, algorithmic problem. So I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about it, and I think it's, it's very exciting. So basically, material discovery, and we are working with material sciences at Cornell, you know, one, uh, one rule that I have is we are going to try to attack a problem if we have access to really the experts. Otherwise, you know, I, I, I worry about, uh, you know, working computer science trying to, to come up with solutions when they have no clue about the underlying problem. So, and there's a, a, a very good group at Cornell and basically, they are interested in discovering new products. For example, that is one of the bottlenecks for energy is really finding good uh, 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 products with good properties. Uh, they have uh, what they call these high throughput experiments, where basically they uh, 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 have a, a setup where they s have guns that sputter three metals onto uh, a silicon wafer. And then they bake, th this produces a thin film, and they bake this at uh, a very high temperature. Then they use electromagnetic radiation to study the crystallographic structure of the thin film. Well, this is quite expensive. The uh, synchrotron, it takes about, it's about $1 million, uh, million dollars a day to run. So I know that, for example, the group we are working with, they have access to the lab one or two weeks a year and you know the students and postdocs don't really, they just sleep they don't sleep they live there for two weeks to do these experiments and they are very intensive and data intensive well the idea is they want to discover new combinations of products with good properties for example they discover that uh, platinum and tantalum is a good combination showing a good correlation with catalytic activity that's good for fuel cell technology. So here is the problem. You have, you know, three, uh, uh, three uh, metals or oxides, and now you, you sample a point and it has a composition, but what you see is really, you would like to know the structure, but what you see is the spectrogram of it. And now you have several points, so you need to know how, where to go to sample. And basically what you want to do is to identify the phases, to cluster these points into uh, what they call phases with similar properties. For example, here there we have all these phases, and what you see is that I look at the point here that has the spectrogram, this point has this, and points in this phase are a combination of these two phase regions, and basically the spectrogram is a, a, a combination of this and that, okay? So what you would like to really do is be able to automatically identify these phase regions and correlate them with interesting activity. For example, here you have the fluorescent activity and you see the lower the better, that's what I'm what told, that really increases the catalytic activity. So this is the good area with uh, a, a, a low uh, a fluorescence uh, uh, activity and therefore this is a, a good, a, a good uh, uh, combination, a, a good product for fuel cell technology. So you would like to do this automatically. Well, I'm not, basically, you can formula, formulate this problem, uh, uh, you know, uh, rigorously, where you, the, your input is a graph, you have a, a, a bunch of uh, points, and what you see basically is the, 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 the spectrogram, which is for each point you have a collection of points or patterns, and you actually know the physics. You know how uh, the peaks shift within a region, these peaks shift, how that if you have a region that is uh, a mixture of alpha and beta, that means that next to it you have to have alpha and beta, so there's this phase connectivity. 
you cannot have more than three uh, phases in a region, and so you have all the physics of these materials that, uh, you know, physicists uh, know it very well how, how, how the materials behave. So what you want to get is a cluster, cluster the points into regions so that you have uh, uh, the, the pure regions but also the mixed regions. So not only do you want to get the clusters, you want to get the labels right to say, for example, this region is a mixture of this and that. And basically, you also want to have the x-ray uh, uh, diffraction patterns of the pure regions. So interestingly, this problem, if we assume we don't have noise in the measurement, and if we assume that we see all the pure phases, then we can actually solve this problem in polynomial time. However, the moment we, we uh, have to uh, remove this assumption that we may not sample one of the phases, that immediately, even if we didn't have uh, uh, any experimental noise, we already would be dealing with an with a hard NP hard problem. Well, now if you uh, uh, inc uh, add noise, really these problems are very hard to solve. Here is a, a formulation of the problem, you know, because as uh, uh, Greg, I like always to starting with, uh, you know, uh, a rigorous formulation, and we did. We, we formulate this problem. And what's interestingly, you know, we can uh, solve uh, 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 rigorous at most like six, ten points, that's it, when we need to sample way more. So then we looked at a machine learning, a kernel-based clustering approach using dynamic time warping, which basically this uses dynamic programming to align the signals and try to find the, the, the minimal uh, stretching to match one, one signal to another. But, you know, Machine learning approaches are good at getting the big picture of the clusters, but really miss the, the physics and the little details and the constant. So, so it, it, in the end, uh, the physical properties are really absent, and therefore the clusters are not meaningful at all. So what we then did, or what we are doing, is combining really an approach that uses probabilistic reasoning with hard and soft constraints, where we formulate the problem you know, rigorously considering hard and soft because of the noise. Then we use machine learning techniques to give us a data-driven perspective of the problem. And we actually have, this was, you know, the physicists couldn't, were impressed. And I have to say, it's not easy to impress the physicists because we could actually here is a, a, a case where you have al aluminum, lithium, and uh, ferro, um, iron, uh, and with six phases. And you see, this is the, the ground truth. This is, I have to say, synthetic data where we, we removed peaks to simulate the noise. So we are really not there yet. But, uh, and you know, previous, the methods they were using would produce this. And our methods actually were very, very close and very good. So what are we trying to do next? Well, we are trying to now, and we're working on this, you know, fold it, discover it, where basically this is a mixed initiative probabilistic reasoning system where basically we combine, you know, probabilistic reasoning, machine learning, but now with human computing. And the reason for that is humans are actually very good at identifying patterns, the, 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 the comparing spectra, et cetera. And that allows us to actually uh, 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 increase the accuracy dramatically. So that's 
what we are doing here is a, a snapshot of the system where you know the, the, the users are given several views and in fact several tools they can use uh, themselves to try to, to solve the puzzle of labeling. So we are, we, and I hope you have maybe suggestions trying to set this up as a puzzle or games where different teams can compete to try to label these uh, 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 structures. So, just as a reference, interestingly, the same kinds of techniques that we use for this problem, we also use for this problem where we have flight calls, which are recordings of board vocalizations, and now you are trying from the signal to identify the species. So here, your basis is rather than having, you know, tantalum, et cetera, you have species like wobblers, now you have the recordings and you have physical constraints about where the species are, etc. And from the recordings, you are trying to infer the species that were recorded. And you, we use very similar techniques. So, in summary, I uh, would say that, you know, sustainability problems are quite uh, challenged, they are unique in scale and complexity. We are dealing with very complex dynamical systems. We would like to, you know, simulate, predict and optimize these systems. In general, we are, uh, to try to learn about the systems, we have huge amounts of data, typically noisy data. We are dealing with multiple scales, multiple a temporal and spatial scale, some phenomena we should predict at, you know, the, the nanosecond or second and others in centuries. And we have, you know, many uh, components with very complex dynamics, uh, often with, uh, con uh, you know, conflicting goals, the agents. So really these problems are very challenging. And you know, the, the, the really the key challenge is how to actually develop metrics and a methodology to understand our actions across different uh, 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 dimensions, uh, environmental, economic, uh, societal. Uh, a good example is, you know, for example, uh, corn biofuel, or how if you don't uh, look at uh, some of the aspects such as the impact of fertilizers or uh, I impact in terms of uh, land change due to, uh, 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 you know, farmers are now changing, going from, uh, you know, food crops to corn crops, which increases the prices of food. So understanding all these uh, if uh, 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 impacts, it is really challenging. We have been focusing on uh, these three areas. And uh, if you now, if you want immediately recognize this, uh, NSF is involved because you see the word transformative. <laughs> but uh, I have to say, you know, each uh, uh, area per se is quite challenging. Now, when you combine, you know, when you are trying to optimize dynamical models, this is really very challenging, especially because typically different communities or different uh, researchers look at these problems. For example, dynamical models. Uh, here we have, uh, uh, you know, people like John Guckenheimer, Steve Strogatz, and Mary uh, uh, Lou Zeman, and but they really don't know much about uh, optimization. And you know, the people doing optimization really. They, you know, there are uh, some, you know, control people, but, you know, these are different areas. And now, how to integrate data, for example, that's the big challenge, for example, for climate change, how to integrate data. So, I see computational sustainability as a two-way street, like the compu computational biology. Oh, I'm going over. Uh, on one hand, we get challenge from, uh, for computer science, new challenge applications. We help to inject some, you know, computational thinking and new methodologies in terms of the sustainability fields. But at the same time, we develop new methodologies for the field. Uh, there is we <laughs> a, a huge community now, huge, you know, it's growing. We had the first uh, 
conference at Cornell. The second one was at MIT. Uh, Brian Williams was uh, chairing it. We had several, you know, uh, symposiums and uh, uh, workshops, and actually special tracks uh, uh, last year at AAAI. In fact, I was very pleased. The best paper at AAAI out of 1,000 papers came from our track. It was a paper by Andreas Krauss and uh, his students. And you know, this year uh, there will be also a special track again uh, uh, at AAAI, pervasive. Uh, it will have a special track on computational sustainability, and probably ICML will also have a special track. So again, you know, this is for us to be able to, you know, create this field. We need to really be a large community. We need to create opportunities for for researchers to publish. To you know, I have to say, I started working on this. Uh, before uh, tenure, but really uh, I waited till tenure to get more involved, and I, I don't think we should do that. There's no reason to do that. So I'm trying to create and uh, a whole community. In fact, the CCC, the um, uh, Computing Community Consortium, is really uh, uh, sponsoring a lot of activities to, to create, uh, you know, opportunities for uh, uh, researchers to, you know, conference, etc. So, in summary, I think the computational sustainability is a very exciting research area. It has tremendous uh, potential to advance the, uh, uh, the state of the art of computer science and hopefully also uh, will have uh, uh, some societal impact. Thank you. <laughs>